Hey, Will Brink here, Brinkzone.com, and I want to cover the topic that is currently going around at uh, Lightspeed uh, on the internet, which is uh, the latest study that came out suggesting that protein, higher protein intakes, uh, cause cancer or increase the risk of cancer. Remember, that's the important difference there. Uh, the problem with this study, and studies like this in general, is the media, of course, uh, having no interest in the facts or the truth ever, especially on topics like this, uh, takes it out of context and runs with it. Uh, and people that uh, even should know better, I have to say, so certain scientists and medical professionals want to know better, uh, tend to fall for some of these headlines and kind of jump on it. Uh, and the problem is there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of nuances to studies like this, of this nature. There are nuances to this particular study that make it difficult to just sort of um, give a quick answer to that it's, 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 it's bullshit or it's a great study. You really can't do that. One of, of course, the main issues with this study is that it's, it's correlational. It's, a, it's an epidemiological uh, style study, and, and which means it uh, it's not a direct intervention study. They didn't take group uh, A and group B and feed them this and feed them that and test, look at what happened to them over time. This study basically looks at large sets of data, uh, other people's data no less, and looks for correlations, i.e. Uh, meat intake at percent and cancer rates. And then they try to uh, adjust for what are called the confounding variables, such as um, did they smoke, did they exercise. Now, the more confounding variables they account for, the better, the tighter the correlation, the stronger the correlation if they still find one. But you have to understand that uh, you cannot make a cause and effect uh, conclusion from such a study. No matter how much you want to, no matter how much it looks like it's there, you cannot make a cause and effect from this. And unfortunately, uh, we have seen this repeated over and over and over again where people do make a cause and effect correlation uh, before they should. And I'll give you, instead of going into the study, because I think there's actually a lot of good reviews and criticism of the study already online that you're going to find that breaks down the, uh, a lot of the weaknesses of such a study, but I'm just going to give you another example. I'm sure you remember decades and decades uh, it was shown through correlational studies that red meat was associated with cardiovascular disease and some other diseases. And those studies were quite strong. Uh, the correlation was quite solid. And they went on for decades and decades. Now, over time, when researchers started to really parse apart, look into more granular data, and start to do more direct intervention studies and such, well, it started to find that it was a lot more complicated, as, this, as it always is, because the human body is complicated. And of course, what started to show itself over time was that the type of red meat, because things like bologna and hot dogs and um, sausage and stuff were considered red meat, and the fat content of the red meat were actually much uh, more responsible or strongly correlated to CVD than red meat. And so what actually started to happen was lean red meat, uh, even done with direct intervention studies, that is actually going and feeding people lean red meat and other stuff, the effects started to fall apart. And therefore what we learned, which most people now know, is that uh, bologna and sausage or whatever is not the same as lean red meat. And if you're eating cuts of lean red meat versus fatty cuts of red meat and so on and so on, the risk of CVD basically disappears. And that is an excellent, one of the best examples ever of, of, of people understanding how, how correlational data can show one thing or suggest one thing and have it, once it is looked at in detail, in minor detail, does not exist. Now, I, this particular study, there's a number of conclusions from the study that are counter to other studies and counter to stronger studies or better studies, which were direct interventional studies. Uh, and there's a number of, like, say, uh, of fallacies or problems of this study. And I'm not going to really go into it because honestly it just doesn't do you a lot of good. Uh, is there some potential uh, truth to this study? Well, the problem is we don't, we don't really know. I, I don't think it's a good idea to just wave your hand and go, ah, it's nonsense, it's not true, because then that's not good science. We don't reject studies that we don't like the results of. That's a bad sign. What you do have to do, though, is go into it with a critical eye and see what they're actually saying. And I'll tell you another thing, which is, uh, seems a little counterintuitive, but a lot of times the conclusions of the study by the authors is not actually supported by their own data. And I know that sounds a little strange, but it happens all the time. The, the researchers themselves still uh, are responsible for the interpretation and the conclusion of their own data. And sometimes they may say something quite strongly, like we found a strong association between X and Y, and you go look at their data, it's not that strong. 
And this study is very similar to that. One also has to look uh, sometimes at who is part of these studies and who are the authors and who does the funding. Uh, I believe the lead author is actually associated directly to a particular diet uh, that wonders of wonders calls for vegetarian uh, eating. Now that doesn't make the study instantaneously null and void, but again you have to look at uh, some of the subtleties. So what's the take home? The take home to me at least, and actually I have to add one more point here, uh, another problem with a study like this is taking the results in isolation. Okay, well let's say the, the effect is actually correct. That is uh, higher meat intakes, raise IGF-1, which may promote higher rates of cancer in some groups. You'll notice they didn't say everybody. It was middle age, and then it went down with older people. But nonetheless, let's say this, the, all of this is true. You also have to look at something called the risk to benefit. That is, uh, there is also a risk to having low IGF. There is not, it's not across the board healthy thing. There are problems with low IGF levels, uh, which I can get into in other articles. Uh, there are, of course, problems with low protein intakes. Uh, you lose muscle mass, sarcopenia. Uh, there can be immune suppression with overly low protein intakes. And again, that's even another argument. What is low protein? What is high protein? Uh, you will actually note that the definition of high protein in this study is not very high. So these are the nuances that you really have to take into account. So let me go back to the take home. The take home is even the risk to benefit. Even if the effect is true, and believe me, this study does not confirm that in any way, uh, you have to look at the total risk to benefit. How much am I benefiting from eating some lean red meats in a part of a, as, as part of a well-rounded diet, and that's another issue this study really didn't look at, versus not eating any. And you have to make those assessments. Uh, what I can tell you as an absolute, and I don't tend to give a lot of absolutes in my videos, but I will tell you as an absolute, there is no free lunch in human biology. None. Zero. Zanata. So, any choice you make to eat more of something or less of something or what have you, has to be looked at from the overall picture of a risk to benefit. You cannot make a single isolated decision that I'm going to eat more of X due to that study because you have to you know, make decisions. Now some of them are very clear cut, like smoking, there really aren't a lot of benefits to smoking and so it's pretty solid clear cut risk to benefit that you're, it's worth quitting smoking, but a lot of other stuff such as some red meat in your diet and a little alcohol or whatever are not so clear cut. You really have to look at the grand picture. So my personal advice is I would not give up your lean cuts of red meat as part of your uh, well-rounded diet at this time. There's no reason to based on this study. If you are eating bologna and sausage and whatever and don't have a terribly good diet anyway and so on and so forth, well you've got more problems anyway and you know what they are. So hopefully this video helps. Uh, I would sub up because I, as you see I give away uh, a lot of good info that's a little more detailed, a little more science-based subjective than most channels. And there are some uh, free newsletter and some, um, I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction or this direction. I always get that screwed up. Uh, free newsletter and downloads that you can grab. And I'll see you all on the Brinks Home.